welcome to the Tankara Angler Level Line Podcast. On today's episode, we've invited a few of our friends to tell another round of fish stories. Thank you for listening and enjoy. Well, it's great to be back here on the Tankara Angler Level Line Podcast. My name is Mike Agnetta, and I'll be your host for today's episode. There's nothing I like more than listening to a good fish story. Documenting anglers telling their tales of adventure, funny circumstances, or even big fish is what Tankara Angler is all about. We did a Fish Stories podcast a few episodes back that was really well received. Check out episode six if you'd like to hear those stories. So we're going to listen to a second set of Fish Stories today as I reached out to a few of my fixed line friends across the Tankara community. With that being said, I'm going to kick it over to our first storyteller from Northern California. Nick here, or as some of you might know me, NorCal Tenkara. I was asked by Tenkara Angler to come on and give you guys a fish story, so let's let's get fishy. Um, started a couple summers ago. I was going out on a backpacking trip to an area that I had heard was haunted, but I had went once before, and let me tell you, the only thing it's haunted with is big trout. So I had some pretty high hopes and I got there, didn't really see much cruising. So I did a lap around the lake, set up tent, made dinner, and then did one last lap around the lake. And I swear I saw the biggest trout I've ever seen just cruising the shallows, had to be every bit of 24 inches and uh, ran back, grabbed my 10 car rod and I was using a little pheasant tail nymph and Pass it out, waited for him to swim by and popped it up off the bottom. Sure enough, he just smokes it and fight on. I'm doing all I can do to keep him from just feels like he's gonna blow the rod up in my hands. And um fight goes on for probably every bit of three minutes, which doesn't sound like a long time, but for anyone that's fought a fish not on a tenkara rod for that long, you know that's a decent fight. And I feel like I finally have him tired out and I reach down to bring him in. I had never done any hand lining before. And I reached out and grabbed my line and just heard that. And my tippet just exploded. And I watched this huge trout just disappear back into the depths. And I went to bed defeated. And honestly, I felt pretty good though about the trip. I was ready to just, you know, the, it gave me the fight. That was the best part. I don't, I, I, if I'm doing this to get the fish in my hand, take a picture of the fish, I'm doing it for the wrong reason. I'm happy, stoked about it. And maybe it was having that feeling of stoke that the fishing gods paid me some karma the next morning as I'm eating my breakfast. What do I see on the far side of the lake? But not only risers, I'm seeing these missiles of fish flying out of the water so i ditch my breakfast and sprint to the other side of the lake and yeah they're all trout it's what dreams are made of and they're all just torpedoing up out take a cast in torpedoes up misses my fly my heart skips a beat take another cast in bullseye fight on big old trout wiggling me left wiggling me right a couple minutes go by and i bring him in I reach down to grab the line. It happens again. This time I jump in and it's only about waist deep right here. I jump in and just scoop this fish and bear hug him against me in my net. Jump back on shore. Um, I had a measure net at the time and it was all I could do to get the fish nose to tail in my measure net. It was either 19 and a half or 20 inches right on the nose. But, oh my goodness, I will never forget that one, he says, until he finds a bigger trout. What a great story from Nick. Man, I was really feeling for him every time that fish came unbuttoned. There's just not a worse feeling when you're hand lining in a fish and you can see it right there and you just can't get it to hand. I'm glad he finally landed a few to make a happy ending to that trip. Well, we're going to kick it up the coast now to my friend Ryan in Oregon, where he's going to tell an interesting story, not about the fish, but about the conditions that he was fishing in. I'm sure glad him and his buddy were able to get out okay. My name's Ryan Kimball. Um, I started fishing to car. This is my third full season. 
Um, tomorrow is actually my 43rd birthday, and I got my first fly rod on my 12th birthday. So I'm about 31 years of fly fishing in general. Um, and I was born and raised in Alaska. So the first 10 years of that uh, was in Alaska. And I moved out to the Pacific Northwest uh, in 2013, I think. Um, can't remember the exact date. I've been down here for a little while. I'm in Oregon now. And I was thinking, like, as far as fish stories go, I mean, I've been fishing my entire life. And I've been I've been all over, um, been to the Bahamas, I've been bone fishing all the time in Alaska. But I wanted to share one um, from last year because I have some pictures to back it up. And it was kind of a cool story The you know, got a lot of, you know, big fish like in Alaska and stuff like that, but not like just a lot of, you know, stories that probably aren't that interesting. Just going out, just having a lot of great days. Right. Um, and I think, are you familiar with Jim Van Grift? Uh, I think you've interviewed him before. He put on the Tinkara bug out. So that river that that happens on the North Fork, Middle Fork of the Willamette, is just phenomenal it's it's wonderful tankara water and it's uh probably about 45 minutes from my house about an hour to get up there from eugene and uh in the summertime it's just fantastic the, the water levels are perfect it's all a lot of pocket water and boulders ripples run it's fairly small uh and you can wet weight it so it's just on a summer evening it's just there's nothing like it. it's amazing there's, there's not big fish in there there's a few but i mean just a lot and they're they respond really well to the so Last summer, uh, I got divorced. I went through quite a bit of stuff where like fishing, I was able to get out sp sporadically an hour here or there. Uh, and I had a day coming up where we had the full day and it was me and my buddy, Mike, and we were gonna go up there and uh, it was supposed to be a hundred degrees. And the I'd been up there a few days before and it was just, it was just glorious. Like it was primed. Uh, and this big wildfire breaks out and Oregon the last couple of months or a couple of years like the summers are bad with the fires it just gets it gets pretty tremendous and this one was close but the wind was blowing in the opposite direction so we were keeping an eye on it and the night before we were supposed to go there was rumors that it was getting fairly close to Westburn which is the town right on that river um but we're like well just keep an eye on it so we get up the next morning and it was about 6 a.m. and I go outside and look in the sky and there's just a black streak of smoke coming right down, just splitting the skies. Blue on one end, sun's coming up, blue on the other, and this is black cloud of smoke. So I get online, I check everything, I check all the fire reports, there's nothing, you know, the road's not closed. And it's hard to tell if that's exactly where we're going. So, and we're both pretty desperate to get out. So I get hold of Mike and we decide, okay, let's go. And as we're going up there, now remember, it's supposed to be 100 degrees. So I'm dressed in, you know, shorts. I'm ready for wet waiting, just being, it's, we have this great day. And as we're driving up there, it's just getting darker and darker, right? And we're like, this cloud is getting thicker and thicker. And about halfway, we're both like, man, this this might be pretty stupid. Like, maybe we shouldn't do this. It's like, no, let's just go. Let's just go as far as we can. Because um, like the, the fishing had just been tremendous, right? So it starts snowing ash. And so now we're like, we're driving into this fire. And, we get to the the base of it's called Ofterhide Highway, and it's it's beautiful. It, it goes uh, all along the North Fork for like thirty miles up and over a mountain, and then down the South Fork of the Mackenzie the other side. So that whole road is just tributaries and beautiful streams, and uh, it's not closed yet. So we're like, well, maybe we're okay. Now keep in mind, like we've gotten fairly jaded by these massive fires because they would just get socked in. Um, we get there to this spot. It's fairly remote where we're at. And I get out of the car and I can see my breath, right? And it's supposed to be 100 degrees and it's probably 40. Like that, the insulation from that smoke cloud is just suffocated. It's, it's in where we're at. So it's freezing. And uh, I tell Mike, I was like, well, let's, we're here now. Let's go. Let's just see what happens. Let's fish for a little bit. Uh, we start hiking upstream and now it's just dumping ash, right? And I, I photographed this whole thing. The sky is just blaze orange. It's, it's, it looks like Armageddon, like we're walking into Mordor and we fish and it's, it's good. We're catching fish and, you know, my throat starts getting sore from the ash and we're like, this is so stupid. And I'm, I'm not freezing. I'm starting to shiver. I'm in my summer clothes. So uh, Mike's way upstream. I'm like, well, I'm going to go back to the car and warm up real quick. And when I get back to the car, I have this note on the underneath my windshield wiper on the 9922 please follow Ocker High drive back to westford asap posted 9 50 a.m 
Cedar Creek Security, fire evacuation, U.S. Forest Service, evacuate now, fire information contact. So I'm like, oh, man, this is this is bad. So I got to go back up there and find Mike. Well, now I feel like an ass because the Forest Service is out there. They've got better things to do, right? There's homes to evacuate. There's people, not these two dork fishermen up there that know better. Uh, so I'm able to, to get Mike. We get back to the car, and as we're, we're unrigging as fast as we can, another Forest Service truck comes flying up. It's like, you guys got to go. You got to go. I'm like, okay, okay, we're going, we're going. And I, they were not happy with this. And I, you know, I felt like an, an idiot. So we go, and you know, we get out of there. And that day, they closed down that entire highway. The next day, they evacuated Westburg. Uh, the town that's right there. One of my best friends lived right on the water. He had to evacuate his whole house, come down to Eugene. Um, and that whole area was closed for about two months. So it shut the whole season down up there. Luckily, I don't think any homes were lost and nobody died. Um, it, was, it was a substantial fire. So when it opened back up, and I think this was in November, I was like, okay, I'm going to go up there and just check it out. And the last turnoff that you take to get to the little spot we were at, the fire had burned down right to that spot. So from there up, it's just black, scorched trees. And, uh, you know, it was just, it was a pretty wild experience and just dumb. And I remember thinking, like, you got to get my priorities in check. Like, I love to fish, but, like, I don't want to put anybody in danger. I don't want anybody out there looking for me, right? Like, there's a there's a cutoff point where at some, some point you got to stop being selfish and just, you know, bag it, maybe head the opposite direction um but yeah that was probably one of my better recent fish stories it was just funny and i got like i said i photographed the whole thing i keep a little tiny blog that i, I post all this stuff on and there, there's a post on there called cedar creek fire and you'll see some of the pictures on there if you want to check it out it's it's pretty pretty impressive on how dark and nasty it was and the fact that we even thought it was a good idea to go through with it was uh was pretty dumb but had the whole day off it's supposed to be 100 you know what do you do so this year, I'll be a little bit smarter about it, but. <laughs> Dude, no pun intended, but holy smokes. I've been up to Oregon. I've actually fished those waters that Ryan mentioned, and he was not lying when he said they are Tenkara perfect. So many nice boulders, plunge pools, pockets. I mean, it's an absolutely wonderful area. Um, but I would never consider fishing it when the sky turns red and it gets all hazy and ash starts falling, I mean, that is either dedication or stupidity. So I'll tip my hat to Ryan and his friend for giving that day a go. I am really happy that there were no, there was no incident and they were able to get out um, unscathed. Wow, what, what a fish story to tell. The next fish story, we're going to kick it over to uh, to my friend Dave in Iowa. Uh, Dave fishes the um, the Driftless area, and he's going to tell us a story about his personal bests on Tankara Tackle. My name is Dave Rossett from Des Moines, Iowa, and I have been uh, a Tankara fisherman for going on 10 years now, I believe. And uh, I'd like to share one of my fish stories with you. And this story actually begins in the spring of 2021, uh, the, tra the start of, uh, of the season here in Iowa. We have no closed trout season, but I don't winter fish. So for me, trout fishing starts somewhere around the March, April timeframe. And over the winter, I was thinking, what could I do to either step up or enhance my tenkara fishing. And one of the things that I really hadn't done was fished a whole lot of kabari flies. I had fished some Sakasa kabaris off and on over the years with minimal success, but in all honesty, I was more of a fixed line fly fisherman with my tenkara rod than really devoting much time to to fishing with Kabari. So I made that decision in, in the spring of 21 that I was going to do more of that. And so I tied up a few flies. In fact, uh, uh, some fella from Florida sent me a, a fly with orange thread and a peacock curl hackle and a white futsu hackle called a road, road cone Kabari. And so I put a couple of those in my box and uh, and went fishing, and I actually uh, started catching some fish, uh, some trout, brown trout, and some uh, some holdover stock or rainbows. And so I felt I was off to a pretty good start, and I did that through 
April, May, and into the middle of June. And here in Iowa, for me anyway, when the mid part of June hits, I kind of back off trout fishing. I don't fish in the summer because it's too hot. And our streams, a lot of them run through either pasture land or wooded areas. And so when the, when the things get green in the growth, I just don't bushwhack much anymore at my age. So I kind of put my trout fishing on hold until the fall after the first frost. But that year in August, we had some unseasonably cool weather, especially on, on a Monday, the first Monday in August, the high in the driftless area of Iowa, I think was going to be like 74 degrees. So my buddy, Larry Murphy and I decided we were going to go fishing. And one of the flies that I had tied up, and it may not actually be a Kabari, but I associate it with Tenkara because I really never heard of it prior to getting into Tenkara fishing, and that was the Utah killer bug. And so I started fishing that fly that Monday, that particular Monday, and I had some pretty good success with it. The reason I chose that fly is there wasn't any bug activity going on at that time of the year. There's some terrestrials, but the stream I was fishing didn't really have a big uh, terrestrial population. So I thought, why not? I'll fish this fly. And we fished all day and then headed home, and I, I had a good day of fishing. Well, lo and behold, the following Monday, the uh, the forecast was uh, going to be cool weather again. So we went up that Monday. And I normally take my flies off at the end of a trip and put them back in a box and, and everything. But I left this, this number 10 Utah killer bug tied onto my tippet and, and my line. I was using level line on my spool. So I just re, re I just started off using that again. And we had a, a, a great day of fishing. And the last section of the stream we fish, uh, my buddy Larry went upstream, I went down and we agreed to meet back at the spot we started at a certain time. And as I was approaching that at the end of the day, he was already there and had waited across the stream and was waiting for me on the other side. And this particular section of the stream is actually a fairly high gradient. It, it, the water flows from one pool and then runs down and then it makes a sharp 90 degree turn into a another pool and then it just kind of strand transcends down uh into some riffles and then a run and then into some flatter water and i have caught some fairly nice brown trout out of there over the years uh but sometimes the fish are there sometimes they're not well i decided i told larry i said hey i want to make a couple casts here and and then we'll go and he said fine he was sitting over there and he was probably maybe i don't know 15 20 feet from me and as the water comes down the, as it, as it comes into the pool there's always a back eddy but i where i was standing I was kind of standing on the the inside turn uh, where the water turns and comes into into a, a little slower run, and there was a big tree there, and so I I cast my my uh, Utah killer bug, and there's it was just a little bitty see maybe a little back current on my side. I suppose you might call it a micro current. I cast my fly in there and was just leading it with my rod tip and was watching my line and. It just did something different, and I set the hook. And as soon as I set the hook, the fish took off towards the pool, and Larry jumped up and says, Dave, that's a big fish. He said, Dave, that's a big brown trout. And I could feel that I was into heavy fish. And I was fishing a 13-foot rod, and the fish was taken off on me, and I could see he was going over towards some rocks. and something popped into my head from a um, a demonstration that rob worthing had done at the midwest ten car fest i think back in 2017 maybe about playing big fish if you want if you don't want a fish to go in a certain direction lead it in the direction that it's going and it'll turn around so this fish was going downstream towards these rocks 
and I didn't have a whole lot of room to to play my rod because I had a tree over my right shoulder and I couldn't get in the water because the bank kind of went off fairly into fairly deep water and I really didn't want to get into the, the water. So I kind of held my rod at about not quite a 90 degree angle and I started pulling the fish downstream. And as soon as he started turning to go back up, I just pulled my rod around and pulled him over for me, towards me. And it was the first time I got a look at it. And I about had a coronary at this brown trout. And so I brought him over close to the bank and got my net out and put him in the net. I said, oh my gosh, Larry. And Larry, I said, Larry, I said, I said, this is a 19 inch fish. And my buddy Larry is a craftsman. And he said, it's a good thing you're not, your measurements aren't very good. He said, Dave, that trout is every bit of 20 inches, if not longer. And so I had him in the net. I was more concerned about keeping the fish in the water than I was getting a picture for whatever reason. I, I knew I wasn't going to do a hero shot. I didn't want to do that. So I just had him in the net and I had a rubber catch and release net. I didn't even have my measure net with me, so I couldn't get a real accurate measure. But we said, so I took my the, the, the killer bug out of its mouth and, and just kind of held it down in the water and watched it. And then I released it and it was kind of interesting because between the bank, between me and where I was on the bank and out a little ways was some water crest. And there was just a little bitty current there. And I released that fish and that trout just laid there for several minutes, just regaining its strength. And I reached down and, and kind of tapped it right in front of its, its, uh, its tail. And then he took off and went back in the water. So I knew it was okay. And that has to be, that's the biggest brown trout that I've ever caught on Tenkara. And the biggest trout that I've ever caught fly fishing. I've caught some 16 and 17 inch browns before up there, but nothing like that. And uh, that fish will always be memorable to me because if I caught it, not that anything I did special, but I caught it during a, a season or a time of my fishing where I was ten car fishing and hadn't I didn't even have any western flies with me that whole whole season now I like I said I suppose you could argue that a Utah killer bug is not really a ten car fly but I don't know of a ten car fisherman that doesn't fish them so that's my story and I'm sticking to it so that was my most memorable fish well, Dave, if you need some sort of validation that a Utah killer bug is, in fact, a Tenkara fly, you've got my uh, my seal of approval. Um, when I tend to think about what sort of flies are in an American Tenkara angler's fly box, there's usually three that come to mind. Um, one is the Sakasa Kibari or a variant of the Ishigaki Kibari is very, very common pattern there. Um, the other one would be like a killer kabari, some sort of, uh, you know, hackled kabari with a yarn body. And then the last one would be the Utah killer bug. Um, without a doubt, um, those are the flies that I see most people reference the most often. Um, so definitely Tenkara flies. And uh, awesome that you were able to catch that big trout um, using one of those patterns. Next up is a story from my friend Isaac, who went out with a few of his friends in Japan and ran into some very interesting environmental conditions. Uh, my name's Isaac, and um, I have a couple of websites. The first one was Fallfish Tenkara, which was about my adventures in Japan, and um, started a new one called I Love To Dot Fish. Um, I was pretty stoked when I saw that URL was available, um, so I decided to snag it. But anyways, I wanted to share a story. Um, fishing trip I had way back in 2016, um with some good friends john pearson and dr paul gaskell um you might have heard of them from discover tenkara which is sadly no longer in production but they have some cool stuff out there and um my brother had was getting married he met this um, lady who lived in liverpool england and so i flew out there in march of 2016 to be in my brother's wedding and while I was there, I wanted to try to fish for grayling. So I reached out to um, Paul and John and asked them if they could take me out fishing. And it just so happened that the uh, first um, 
the first day that I was in country was the last day of grayling season. So I, uh, my wife and I, we headed out there on the river on the last day of grayling season, and I caught my first couple of grayling. It was a awesome trip. Um, fast forward a few years, and um, they were coming out to Japan to link up with uh, Goishi to do some filming. Um, Sabata-san and the uh, Tenkara community out there in Japan. And um, so we got a chance to fish together in um, Gunma Prefecture, which is about two hours north of Tokyo. And uh, it was a great day. The river was awesome. Uh, it was the last day of May and um, flowers were blooming. The river was nice and cold and running deep. The fish were biting and we were having a great time out there fishing. And uh, we get up to this waterfall and Paul and John set up their cameras to do some shooting. And while we were doing it, we didn't notice right away, but the river had um, all of a sudden gone from a very clear, gin clear color to chocolate milk brown and was just raging. So we grabbed our camera gear. We were on the wrong side of the river. We had to get to the other side because that's where the trail was to get back to our car. And we forded across this river and it was getting deeper by the second logs were floating past us and um we managed to get to the other side and uh, the only way to get out of the river valley was to climb this cliff and so we got our camera gear slung over our shoulders and we're trying to cram it back into our packs and the river is getting deeper and um we climbing this cliff to get out of there somebody had thrown this old rope down and i don't know how long it had been there for decades and we were just praying that it wasn't going to break <laughs> and um as we're going up the um we watching the river just continue flooding down below us and um we managed to get out of the valley didn't hit anybody with rocks as we were climbing out as the cliff was crumbling around us and um so we get back down to the car and we call Goishi and we told him what happened. And he's like, oh, you know, it sounds like there was an ice dam upstream, a uh, snow dam upstream that had burst. And we got caught in the, uh, the flood from that, which apparently is fairly common in Japan. And I had been fishing out there for two or three years at that time and had never experienced that before. So it was uh, quite an eye-opening experience, uh, something I definitely won't forget anytime soon. Now that was pretty interesting. I don't think I've ever fished on a on a stream or a river that's had a had a snow dam holding back the water, uh, much less had it kind of burst while I was fishing and having the water be very clear in the morning and then all of a sudden become really fast and and high. Um, I'm I'm glad that Isaac and uh, the Discover Tenkara guys were able to get out of that situation um, safely. I don't know what's going on with these environmental stories today between these guys and Ryan, but um, I, I, like I said, I'm, I'm happy everybody was safe and sound and able to tell those stories another day. Well, speaking of stories, the next one that we have um, is for all of you big fish lovers out there. Um, our friend Chris from Montana is going to tell a story about getting into kind of a, a little bit of a remote wilderness where there's nothing but giant fish. So my, my name is Chris Frankwe. I live in South Central Montana. I started fly fishing probably better part of 45 years ago. And off and on over the years between Navy time and stuff like that, uh, I was able to fish more often than others uh, at various times in my life. But over about the last 15 years, I kind of got into it pretty seriously. And I got into Tenkara about... I want to say about six years ago, got kind of got into the fixed line. And for me, it was l not the the romance of, of the history of it or the nostalgia of it. It was more of uh, cheating as a way of having longer rods for my kind of Euro European style nymphing once, when I was into that. And over time with my backpacking and hiking uh, that I do, it kind of meshed more with my lifestyle. So I started packing those rods everywhere I went up in the mountains. And for me, when I say the mountains, I'm specifically talking about the Beartooth Wilderness. And probably, well, just over a year ago, I started recording some of my trips. And it was really my buddy and I were 
we're like, man, we should have some of these for history rather than scrolling through 4,000 pictures on our phone to reminisce about a particular time or a particular fish where we caught something or saw something spectacular scenery or something like that. Um, and that's where I started my YouTube channel and hence the name Ten Car on the Trail because I spent a lot of time hiking on the trail in the wilderness. And it's about a a lot of people don't understand necessarily what a wilderness is, but it's a national designation. It's almost a million acres, this one that's near me. So I have a lot of access points and, you know, I feel blessed that that I can spend a lot of time up there in the summers. And it's a brief, a brief window of opportunity in order to hit some of the, the places where I want to go. There's over 300 fishable lakes up there. And my goal, I have a big eight foot by five foot wall map and I pin all the lakes that I've been to. And I'm around halfway there now, and I'm hoping I can uh, cross some more off my list before my knees go away, um, because I used to be a runner as well. But um, there's, to me, memorable fish uh, take on a lot of different meanings or memorable for a lot of different reasons. It might be, you know, my first fish, and I have a whole gaggle of rods, as as most people who know me uh, know. Uh, and sometimes it's it's the first fish that I catch with a rod or it's the biggest fish or the, the smallest fish. My buddy and I always have contests of who can catch the smallest fish. Uh, but more often than not, it has to do with the location that I catch fish. And I, I love being up in the wilderness. I go 99% of the time I'm by myself, 15 or 20 mile hike in one way. And to me, that's that's the, the the best place on earth. And so for me, it's more it's more about the journey to get to the fish rather than uh, sometimes the fish itself. And so it's the degree of difficulty to get to a fish, the degree of difficulty in catching the fish. Um, and there's one particular lake, and I'll I'll send you some pictures if you want to throw them up or whatever. But uh, I had been researching this lake. It's well known in Montana for uh, for producing very large golden trout. Uh, at one point, it held the, held the state record, and I've seen fish in there that would have break would break the current state record. Um, I mean, they're pretty impressive. And for me, I, I researched it for a couple of years. I talked to Fish and Game. I talked to old time, uh, you know, long time Forest Service Rangers. Uh, you know, friends and, and contacts at the fly shop and just asked around. And it took me about two, two years, maybe three years before I really got the, the nerve to, to try to get into this lake, because one of the things that it's also known for is the difficulty in getting there. And so to me, that just screamed, I had to try. Um, and it's about, you know, depending on which way you go in. And that's part of what my research taught me is a lot of people go the wrong way. And if you go the wrong way, it might be a couple of days or, or or it might be, um, you know, turn around because it's just not worth it. Uh, but I was able to get in, find found a way. It, you know, it's, there's a lot of bushwhacking. There's a lot of boulder hopping. There's some steep elevation, uh, steep climbs. And it's probably in that nine to 11 mile range to get in there. It's well known for bears. You'll see a lot of bear sign and things like that so uh, but still a lot of people do it because of what it's known for with the big golden trout so that's on a lot of people's bucket lists and that was on mine uh, i was fortunate over the several trips that i was able to kind of find a way to be catch fish consistently and they're extremely picky fish you think typically high alpine lakes are you know, easy, throw out any fly and you're going to, you know, the, the fish will cooperate. These fish uh, are, I don't know what planet they're from, but they, they, you, you can see them cruising up and down just feet from shore sometimes. And, and I'm talking, you know, uh, might, might be five, six pound golden trout that are, that are swimming by. And if it's still, if the water is still just, you just, just, pack up and go back to camp and take a nap because it's very difficult. I always like to have a chop on the lakes when I'm fishing, you know, indicator fly motion, things like that. Uh, but I was able to figure out a way to catch a few here and there and, and being, being consistent at catching them. I mean, maybe one or two a day. I mean, that's, it's, it's very slow 
fishing. It's like watching, you know, the proverbial paint on the wall dry, you know, watching that that bobber waiting for it to go down. Uh, and I did initially with traditional rod and reel for a long time. And then I decided, well, I've I've caught a few fish that way. I wanted to use my bamboo rods because it has sentimental value. So a, fr a, a friend made the rods for me. So I said, you know, you make this rod for me that can handle some of these fish and I'll send you a picture with, you know, the rod and, and the golden trout. And then once I started into Tenkara somewhere in there, and I've been to this lake every year for the last seven or eight years, except for last year because of the flooding, some roads were closed and, and, and couldn't get into it. But uh, then I decided once I got into fixed line fishing, every winter I make a list of these are the lakes I want to go to. These are the fishing goals that I have and objectives. And one of them was, I want to take a fixed line rod in there and catch a golden, you know, one of these good golden trout, not, not a 10 inch, 12 inch golden trout. Like I, like I have, um, but it's a very unique experience at this lake. It's a, it's a dual lake situation. So they spawn in about a hundred yards of Creek between the two big lake, little lake, and they grow up. The fry will grow up in the small lake. And then when the water's high, they can, they can transit into the bigger water. And so there's limited reproduction. There's a lot of shrimp, a lot of, a lot of food for them. So they grow extremely large because there's few of them and there's good food. Um, but that particular time I made it in there. I talked to Chris Stewart a lot on, Hey, what rod at the time I didn't have a, you know, a wall of rods to, to choose from, asked him his advice on what rod can handle this or that. And in my mind, and, and I'm biased because I love the place, it's not, these aren't ordinary fish to me. That, I mean, I've always said that the pound for pound, the, these fish in this particular lake um, really punch above their, their weight class. Uh, I've seen them take, you know, they've taken me into my backing with con conventional rods, rod and reel, and they just pull hard. Uh, I don't know how else to explain it. But anyways, I ended up, bringing a tarp rod with me, a flying dragon, you know, 17 footer, the 53 uh, with me and seven meter floating line indicator, the usual junk dangling off the bottom, whether it's leeches, chironomids, scuds, things like that. And unfortunately, the time I went there, it was, there was no wind. It was extremely hot, mosquitoes eating you alive. Um, and no chop on the water to give any motion to anything. And, you know, they can sit there and, and, and examine your fly and, and laugh at you and then swim away. And uh, it was probably the second day, the end of the second day, hadn't caught a fish in the big lake. The little one, they'll cooperate, but that's not what I was there for. And um, had a brief breeze caused a little bit of disturbance. And you know, this is weird. It's like, there'd be a little disturbance in the water surface over here and smooth as glass over here. So I'd pick up and two hand cast and get the, get everything over there wherever there would be a disturbance. Cause it's get a little bit motion. It just, it works better. Um, and I'm, you know, stumbling in and out of con consciousness, uh, just bored out of my mind, but I'm determined if, you know, I may be old, I may be slow, and uh, but I'm stubborn. And so at one point I turned my head and I looked back and my indicator was gone. And, you know, it took me a couple seconds to register what was going on. And I fumbled for the rod and yanked it probably way harder than I needed to or should have. Um, but I had a good fish on the line. And, and th the first run or two that these fish make uh, can be doozies. And this one did and nearly straightened me out a little bit. And I'm using 3X tippet on the, you know, on, on this, this rod, just because I, I've seen fish that can come out of this lake. And I'm thinking of whatever that article was of fish, you know, fighting large fish. And I, I've heard, heard you talk about them before, you know, parallel to the water, do semicircles, all that kind of stuff. And, and it, it was, it was probably a, a more of a clown show, but it worked. The rod was obviously able to handle it. It wasn't the biggest fish I've ever caught um, out of that lake, you know, golden trout out of that lake. But I, I took it from shoreline to shoreline. I just remember seeing the colors as it's twisting and turning under the water because it's just it's just crystal clear. And I'm backing up because I didn't want to handline the thing. So I'm backing it up, trying to beach it and then, you know, 
throw down my rod and go grab it before it swims away sort of thing. And uh, so it, it, I just remember the total sense of relief and joy that I accomplished it. Uh, but it didn't really end there. I had accomplished that. I said, okay, I've had enough of looking at an indicator. And I've, there were several fish that were rising. And I st to this day, I still don't know what they rise for most of the time on the, on this lake. But there's some splashy rises. And there's there are caddis in the water. Um, but I, I decided I'm going to have some fun now. I checked that box. And I'm now I'm going to go do something just fun. And in this one corner of the lake, it's very muddy, silty. There's logs. And but they, they just congregate. You can just see them, see them school, you know, just sight fishing for these things. So here I am, big carp rod, floating line, and I'm putting size 20 midges on, you know. So I, I have a dry dropper, if you want to call it that. It's a little max midge, size 20, with a about a size 20 or 22 juju midge from Charlie Craven, you know, uh, designs. Um, so I'm dry dropper, hoping that little tiny midge is, you know, just looking for a twitch in my, in my leader, uh, on the, you know, or tip it on the line. And, and so I actually caught a couple with the carp rod on the, you know, size 20 midge dry fly and, and also the, uh, the emerger on it as during the same trip. So to me, you know, this, this, this event checked all my boxes it's a difficult lake to get into it's a it's a one of my favorite hikes in you know catching one of my favorite fish and it, it you know the difficulty to catch to get these picky fish uh to catch them so for me th those are a couple of my most memorable fish on one of my most memorable trips <laughs> man if, if you are only listening to this podcast, whether it be on your phone or in the car or wherever, you really owe it to yourself to check out the YouTube video version of this podcast. We inserted some of the pictures of the fish that Chris was describing in his story, and there's no words to describe just the how big they are, how thick they were, toads, pigs, footballs. I don't know. They were some really impressive trout. So if you have a couple extra minutes and you are only listening to this, make sure you pop on our YouTube channel, if nothing more than just to see the pictures of these really impressive fish. Well, our last story, or maybe not last story, maybe that's a little bit of foreshadowing, um, comes from our friend Jeff in Tennessee. Jeff is going to tell us a story about a first fish and a big fish, not the same fish, during one trip. I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. My name's uh, Jeff Lamino. I'm the uh, owner of Riverworks Rod Company based out of Signal Mountain, Tennessee. The story starts on my favorite creek in the Driftless in Wisconsin. And uh, the day uh, I was fishing with uh, Jason Sparks' father, Greg, on Timber Cooley, and... I guess it's, it's no real surprise with our group, my favorite stream, and uh, I spend a lot of time there. But it was Greg's first day um, on timber, and uh, one of his first days with the Tenkara rod in his hand, period. We're pitching along. Greg's kind of, you know, doing his thing. I wasn't really instructing him a whole lot, but, I mean, he was making some casts and wasn't picking up any fish. Um, together we kind of ran through one of my favorite stretches and he, he went through first and, uh, I picked up a couple fish, you know, nothing, nothing major, but anyway, it comes to a little, a little horseshoe as with a lot of streams in the drip list, they're very small and this is no exception. It was, uh, it's about three or four feet wide. Um, and it runs through a ripple section and then it drops down into this big deep hole which is kind of unusual for that stream but it's a really unique area of that of that creek and it does a dog leg right runs um underneath some big willow trees that that kind of uh the branches are really close to the to the creek itself it's a fairly difficult section it's not an e it's not an easy cast to get you know, underneath and, and, and make a good drift under there. 
But anyway, I sat back. I was maybe 30, 30 yards, 30 yards away from Greg. And I kind of was like basically willing him mentally to make this one drift, like, you know, let the let the fly run down the riffle and then catch that big hole and then just kind of work its way to the side. And somehow he did. He did. He made a great it was a great cast. And he and he I saw the bend from you know the top of the top of the reeds. The 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 grass was getting a little bit high right there. But anyway, I saw the bend kind of moseyed over as he was in when I get there, this fish that he had was just thrashing on the surface of the waters. And he had it, he had the tippet wrapped around the, the fish's tail. So it was a really abnormal looking scene. This fish looked like it was like, is it foul hooked or what's got? And it was a nice fish. It was a really nice fish. And he's, you know, had the putting pressure on the fish and, I walked up and I was like, "Oh, let's get this let's get this guy in. Let's see what we got here." And uh we did without too much damage to the fish. And it was about a, maybe 16 inch, 16 17 inch brown, beautifully colored like all the driftless brown trout, just a butter, just a beautiful beautiful brown trout. So, you know, we we kept it in the water and, you know, took a look at it. Neither one of us took thought to even bring phones or cameras or anything else we were just fishing that day so anyway i walked back up above the riffle and um anthony naples had been telling us um you know that he had been seeing a lot of fish really in the skinny skinny water the, like just a few inches deep so i thought about that and i was using you know my typical nymphing setup for the drift list which that day was the, it was the 360 and about a 16 Pertagon single fly, um, and I decided just to to go ahead and uh, and work this really long riffle section that was more than six inches deep, maybe five feet wide. Um, you know, not ideal. You know, holding water for any fish of any size anyway. Um, but anyway, I did a couple drifts, nothing, nothing, you know. I was like, eh, this is a waste, this is a waste. I'm going to move down to this, you know, this awesome pool that's right, you know, 30 feet this way. So I did my last, my last cast and drift through that little ripple section. And, you know, it's like, I've got like three inches of tippet in the water. Of fly. I didn't even see the fly. Something, something grabbed it in the riffles probably like like anthony had been telling us these fish aren't even really moving they're just kind of like filter feeders you know whatever whatever hits them in the nose coming down that ripple is what they eat so i got lucky i got lucky and it was a and it was a big fish it was my personal best driftless fish and he immediately scooted down the scooted down the uh, the ripple and ended up in the big pool so he sounded, and the pool is probably 10 feet deep. I don't know how deep it is, but it's it's deep. It's deep enough to where the fish sounded. And Greg was behind me, you know, and I, needless to say, I was excited because it was, nice. it was a nice fish for that to catch in, you know, six inches of water. So we fought on for a little bit and eventually got him. There was a little sandy beach right there. I just went ahead and didn't beach him, but I, you know. Neither one of us had a net either, of course. No camera, no net. Um, but got him, got him, you know, tired enough to where I could, to where I could at least just touch, you know, the Pertagon and 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 get him loose. I didn't, you know, we never held him or or anything like that. But he just kind of just kind of chilled there for a second in the in the pool. So I finally like Greg. I, I don't normally like to get these fish out of the water, but. I went ahead and grabbed his tail and, and picked him up and we both took a look. And um, anyway, it was a uh, we and then we both just kind of plopped down there on that pool and like, is there another really nice brown in there somehow? And there wasn't, but we sat down and reflected a little bit and 
kind of a special moment. His first, his first fish, you know, his first ten car fish, and my personal best within the space of about, I don't know, five minutes, five minutes worth of action. So, kind of a special thing. Kind of a special. I've got a lot of fish stories from, you know, forty years of, of fly fishing, but. That was a good one. That was a good one, especially with the uh, with fixed line setups. And that's it. That's my story. That was a really cool story from Jeff. Um, not only helping Greg catch his first fish, but having the two of them there side by side when Jeff got into his really big fish. Uh, man, that, that's a really, really cool day. I was actually fortunate enough to be there that day. I wasn't fishing with those two. I was fishing a little bit further upstream. Um, but I did get a picture of Greg um, fishing that exact bend of water that Jeff was describing. So that's the picture that you do see in the video version um, of this podcast. All in all, great story for Jeff. Um, an awesome way to end this podcast. Speaking of, we'd love to get your feedback on the Tenkara Angler Level Line podcast. And there's a couple ways to do that. If you're watching on YouTube, it'd be awesome if you would like this video subscribe to our channel and click that notification bell for, for updates, um, or just leave a comment. Any of those interactions, let us know you're interested in what we're doing and kind of motivates us to make more of these podcasts. If you're listening on your phone or in your car on an app or a streaming service, and that service allows you to leave ratings or comments, please go ahead and do so. I was on Apple the other day and I saw we had some ratings, but we didn't have any, you know, comments or reviews. Would love to see some of those start popping up and obviously subscribe to the podcast to get the next episodes when they come out. And then last but not least, you can always go to TankaraAngler.com and click on our podcast page. If you scroll to the bottom, we have an open text box where you can basically tell us anything. You can tell us what we what you like, what you don't like about the podcast. You can tell us who we should be talking to, topics we should be talking about, or hey, if you even have a fish story that you think is good enough for a future future episode, let us know, and perhaps we can integrate that into a, into one of our next podcasts. Well, in closing, um, I do have a kind of bonus story to kind of squeeze in here, um, kind of Marvel style post credits. Um, Isaac wanted to come back and tell a story about an animal encounter he had on stream recently. So with that, I'm going to say goodbye. Thank you for listening and uh, have Isaac take us out. I don't know. I've got another story. If you got a, if you got a minute. Uh, so last week I went up to this river. Um, it's about 30 minutes from my house and, um, this section I had never fished before. I was excited to go check it out. Um, it's pretty remote. You have to hike in about a mile, mile and a half just to get to the river. And then you hike upstream. There's no trails. So you have to like wet wade up the creek um, to get to the point where I had turned around last year and I wanted to fish from that point up higher. And so, I mean, it was a beautiful day. It's spring here in Connecticut and uh, just absolutely phenomenal fishing weather. And the trout were biting. It's uh, the creek is does get stocked, but there's a lot of holdovers, so you can catch some pretty good wild trout from last season or the season before that. And um, I'm fishing this really nice pool, and all of a sudden, like this deer jumps it right out of the bushes right in front of me, takes off into the forest. And uh, it was really pretty, just watching her bound through the forest, her little white tail flickering, um, flickering away. And um, they come around the next bend, and there's this gorgeous pool and i can see the fish right there holding in the riffles and i the sun comes out the water's like 57 degrees so when the sun came out i just kind of stopped to warm up and because i'm i'm wet waiting just you know my japanese sawana bori shoes and some shorts and um all of a sudden i hear this snarling growling noise of this large animal just fighting and it's splashing in the river and I can hear this other animal squeaking and um, I'm like, what the heck is going on? This is crazy. So I, I've, I'd just been fishing for like an hour and I had three or four hours left of fishing. I'm like, well, I'm not going to turn around and just go back. Like, forget that I'm going upstream, but if I die, I want everyone to know how I died. So I bust out my iPhone and I start recording <laughs> video and I can hear the animals snarling and they're fighting and they're splashing. 
I'm like, it sounds like a bear or a mountain lion eating something. I'm just like, dude, this is sketchy, man. So I start walking up the stream and I see this little, this movement on the bank and it's this animal. And I stop and I look a little bit closer. It's this huge raccoon. And I was like, oh, well, maybe that's what was making all the noise. So I keep walking up a little bit and I see the raccoon and it's walking downstream along the bank. And then this otter comes up and starts swimming down the river next to the uh, bank. And it's chasing the raccoon um, out of, I guess, where its home was or something like a raccoon. It tried to break into its nest or something or uh, try to take its food. And um, so this otter swims within like maybe five feet of me before it sees me. And then it rears up on its hind legs and starts hissing and growling at me. So I grab the stick on the side of the bank on the bank. And I start splashing the water and I'm yelling at it um, and just take off running upstream. <laughs> and, um, thankfully, the otter didn't follow me. Um, and thankfully, I found a trail uh, further upstream that I was able to use to get around because I was not looking forward to having to backtrack past that angry otter again. But um, I got it all on film and I put it on my YouTube channel. So. <laughs> It's, it's there for the masses to see. I did cut out the part where I was yelling at the otter, though, because uh, the audio got pretty choppy. <laughs> that was that was pretty wild. I've never experienced anything like that before. I was by myself. I told my wife about it, and she was pretty upset that I had continued fishing upstream. She said, what the hell's the matter with you? And sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to keep fishing. What can I say? <laughs> So yeah, there's my second story.